My name is H. Beecher Hicks III. I'm the CEO of the National Museum of African American Music. I want to welcome you all to this event this afternoon, the Soundtrack of Civil Rights Movement, Part 2. I am excited to be here. I can't wait for the program. And I'm excited to see all of you. You all look great, so give yourselves a hand. Um, my friend Natalie is taking pictures, and so uh, indulge her as she moves around today. And in fact, Natalie, come on up here and take a picture from up here, because they look, y'all look great. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, but first I want to take, while Natalie's taking a couple of pictures, I want to tell you just a little bit about where the museum stands. What do y'all think about the idea of having the National Museum of African American Music at Fifth and Broadway? Well, we are excited about it too, and uh, in fact I've got a couple of my board members, and one of them is Dr. Outlaw, but another is An Anasa Troutman is here with us, uh, and she just moved to Nashville from Los Angeles, California. Anasa, w wave your hand, and y'all welcome her later and show her some love. She's told me she was trying to hide in Nashville for the last couple of weeks she's been here, and I told her that was over today, so y'all help make that right. So we think that the construction for the museum is going to start as early as the first quarter of next year. So we're about six to eight months away from getting started. And then uh, we think the museum will open about two years after that. So that'll be about early 2018. And we are, of course, hard at work right now working on our curatorial work, uh, beginning, just beginning to gather artifacts and that sort of thing, completing work on the storyline so that we have a compelling and interesting national and even global story that we can tell about this great music to include an awful lot about the Nashville story and its influence on American music. And so we're hard at work on that. And then, of course, we're doing programs like this. We do a lot of things uh, in the Nashville public school system, and we're beginning to branch out and look for ways to do those programs around the country already. Uh, and then, of course, we do events like this, which uh, certainly are the highlight of my week, and I hope that it is yours as well. And so without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Outlaw. Uh, not only is he my friend, mentor, and board member uh, at the museum, but he also is a professor at Vanderbilt, and he teaches about racial matters and social political life in the United States uh, and their legacy and practices in Europe and European American philosophy uh, in the examples of Martin Delaney, W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, and Booker T. Washington, Ralph Ellison, Tony Morrison, and others. So in other words, the brother knows what he's talking about. So he's going to uh, join us and moderate. And so while he comes, please join me in thanking Vanderbilt University and TPAC for this partnership to deliver this program. Thank you. Dr. Outlaw? Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Now, y'all got to respond like you're members of the Baptist Church, even if you're not. You know, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, amen. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of Vanderbilt University, let me thank you for coming and welcome you to this program. And particularly, I want to thank our colleague, brothers and sisters from TPAC who've joined us in this endeavor, of this two-part endeavor. And let me thank especially my colleague, friend, uh, good sister, Gail Williams. Gail, where are you? Wave, where, where are you? <laughs> Who is the Associate Director of the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Governmental Relations. And Gail is responsible for community engagement. So she's one of our, you know, most stimulating partners in this project here. This is the second part of a two-part series. As a number of scholars have helped us to understand, every generation has its soundtrack. Each of you, I'm sure, has those particular musical numbers that highlight particular moments and significant events in your life. Every social movement has its soundtrack. And part of what we're going to be witnessing and learning from today is about the soundtrack of some young folk and current views. Some years ago, I, working in another institution, I had an occasion to spend some time with and get to know a bit a man by the name of Gerald Levin. Gerald Levin was at that time the head of Time Warner and of Time Warner Music. And Gerald and Time Warner were getting a lot of criticism for the music that was being presented commercially.
by a lot of young African American rappers from cop killer to et cetera, et cetera. So he was getting a lot of pressure to stop publishing these young musicians. Gerald said something in response that I've never forgotten that has become a lesson for me that I hope you will take up. He said, you know, we, and I think he meant largely white folk in particular, he said, we didn't listen to Malcolm X. Maybe this time we will listen to this young generation. There are young people who are creating music out of the experiences of their lives and doing it in some really astoundingly creative ways. Some of us of my generation, we don't want to listen because we're so busy looking at how low their pants are coming on, <laughs> how big the girl's earrings are, or whether or not her midriff is covered when she's out in public. I get all of that, but there is the importance of listening to them. They are speaking to the world from the context of their experiences, their joys and sorrows, their pains and frustrations, their excitements, their notions of possibilities, some of which we don't pay attention to or quite witness. It is crucial then that we hear about and from the current generation. Things are happening in our country that we need to learn more about and to hear from those who are out and about in ways that sometimes we may criticize, but there's more to them than that. To lead us in hearing and learning for this program today is good brother Eric Dozier, about whom you can read in your program. Eric, take us on this learning lesson, please. All right, how y'all doing this afternoon? Or this, yeah, it is afternoon now. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, with uh, these uh, distinguished conversationalists. Thank you, Dr. Outlaw, and, and uh, 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 thank you, Brother Hicks, for for having us here and, and uh, we just want to, uh, we're going to do this a little differently today. We're going to spend some time together and uh, talk about a few things. Uh, we're going to have some poetry for you, some music, uh, some thought, some ideas, and uh, we ask you to kind of chime in in your own way. You will be asked to sing as well, so I'm just letting you, I'm letting you know now. Um, so, but before, before we get started, let me just uh, uh, introduce uh, a, a couple of folks, and we're gonna. Uh, I, I know that the uh, that their bios you can you can read all of their bios, uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you uh, uh, tell you a little bit about who they are, uh, based on my first impressions of them. Because uh, I, I, you know, I tried to have have a little conversation with them before uh, we we uh, we came up here together. Uh, had coffee with brother uh, uh, Rashad, the poet Rayford, and uh, you know he's a he's an artist, uh, a poet, and an activist, an actor as well. And and uh, his his day job, I guess, if you want to call it, is being a, a a mentor poet for the organization Southern Word that that helps young people develop and articulate uh, 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 and present their voice around issues that are affecting their communities. So, Brother Rayford. <laughs> Had a long conversation with uh, Sister Stephanie Pruitt uh, the other day, and you know what I I think what I uh, many things I like, but what I like the most is that she's an art, uh, art uh, entrepreneur, and she doesn't believe in artists being broke. So she helps us develop. <laughs> she's an artist development person, but she's also an accomplished and award-winning poet uh, and an activist as well. And finally, we have. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a caller, Dr. Tracy. 
who has, has, has traveled extensively in, uh, in France and lived there and, uh, and written extensively, extensively about the presence of African American women uh, in Paris. Um, and so uh, with that said, uh, I wanted uh, to play a little video to kind of give you context, uh, set the context for our discussion today. I need y'all to repeat after me. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. What's going on? What's going on? Young people have decided um, that enough is enough and that it's no longer a time for slow incremental change or for compromise. And that what we need right now are radical shifts in our social system, in our economic system, and in our criminal system. And we need folks who have been in the movement for a long time to really be supporting their capacity to win. Can you name some of the younger people who are just as involved that we might not know about? Folks like the Black Youth Project, Folks like Millennial Activists United in Ferguson and Tribex in, in Ferguson and St. Louis. Hands Up United in Ferguson. The Dream Defenders. Dignity and Power Now in Los Angeles. We're just a little too caught up in the way the world sees us. And the way my people see yours. And the way my people see yours. And the way our people see ourselves. 1996, a Jewish girl was born with the Shabbat candles glistening in her eyes. 1996, a Muslim girl was born with the Ardana ringing in her ears. She only knew of her own, of Jumra, Kabbalah, Shabbat, Hashim, Smirot, Allah, Adonai. She never noticed that Muslim girl holding the same needles and threads that she did. So we quilted generations from stitches and callous palms of their past. Friday prayers, religious songs, like God. We are both birthed from resilience, yet raised by assumptions. I wanna know what's going on. So I know there's been some controversy, Mark. You know, uh, we were talking yeah. about this before. I guess. What's I was the thing this is gonna? What's come. lay it on? <laughs> what is, talk to us what Black Spring is. Yeah. I mean, Black Spring is really about looking at this moment as not these isolated incidences. Like the media really wants to say, well, this happened in Ferguson, this happened in Baltimore, this happened in New York. Are they the same? Yes, they're the same. Black people are not a monolithic group, but what we are facing is something that's extreme, and that's poverty. That's homelessness. That's high rates of joblessness. That's law enforcement invading our communities day in and day out. And we, we are uprising. And so this Black Spring is about really talking about uh, a national uprising. And we should, be, we should be honored to be a part of this moment. Stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 But even with all the battery and the abuse, we are still so beautiful. Our babies like balls of light bright enough to brighten the darkness of the battlefield. But when I look into my daughter's face, it only reminds me that there's a battle still and that the battle's real and that a draw is a win for losers. We must win. The truth is, when I said the sky is mine, by mine I meant I and I. By I and I, I meant you and I. The sky is ours. Heaven's fallen. We either fly or die. We must win. We have died so many times. They have killed us so many times. We have died so many deaths. We have died for everyone. We have died for everything. We have died for nothing. We are done with death. 
We are done with death. We will not die another day. We are the true and living, and we must win. Howard Zinn was documenting uh, the Young People's Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, I shared this at the last panel discussion, but I think this is a good tie-in because what we want to talk about is uh, looking at uh, the roots of this movement coming out of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s and kind of explore that for a moment. But this is what he says about the music because the music was so prevalent. He said it would be easy to romanticize them, but they are too young, too vulnerable, too humanly frail to fit the stereotype of heroes. They don't match the storybook martyrs who face death with silent stoicism. The young fellows sometimes cry out when they are beaten. The girls may weep when abused in prison, but most often, however, they sing. This was true of the farmer and labor movements in this country and of all the wars, but there has never been a singing movement like this one. Perhaps it is because most of them were brought up on the gospel songs and hymns of the Negro church in the South. Perhaps also because they are young, probably most of all because what they are doing inspires song. So, my first question that I would kind of want to throw out to our conversationalist is, uh, uh, you know, I'd like for us to kind of explore uh, the roots of this modern uh, civil rights movement um, and uh, kind of see if there is any tie-in to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s and see what any of your thoughts are around that. And particularly as it relates to the art and the music that is emerging currently. Well, I definitely think that it's all <clears throat> uh, relatable. Um, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of circumstances, uh, with there being nothing new under the sun, um, the movement of the 60s and the, the demands of that movement are s some of the same demands of this movement. Um, people want to be free. You know, people, wanna, people want to walk around and live a life that they choose to live without fear. Um, fear of oppression, fear of death, um, and fear of um, a, a struggle and a, and a stranglehold on the mentality to be the person that God has called you to be. So I think some of the demands are, are definitely the same, and a lot of the, the music that was taken from the 60s um, is being utilized uh, today, and, and the influence of of the movement of the 60s from James Brown. Um, even um, in today's music, Kendrick Lamar has a new song out called King Kunta, which is based on uh, some of James Brown's um, music. And so it's definitely being used in the, in the, the generation that's, that's um, coming about right now. They're definitely focused on freedom, right? And they're definitely focused on change. And I think for a long time there was this disconnect because we sheltered you know, our, our children and our youth um, you know, we, we made sure that my parents and my parents' parents made sure, you know, your grandbabies got everything they want, right? They don't really have to work for anything. You just, the new Nintendos, 360s, whatever, right? You just, so it's kind of like that, that shield was kind of put up. And so from the 60s to now, it's, it's been this shield where young people haven't really, they haven't really dealt with anything in this capacity. So now when you see young black men and women uh, being murdered and, and being killed, and, and it's like, but okay, they're being killed by people who are supposed to be protecting us, like, it, then it becomes a thing of like this awakening that's happened. And it's, so now you have this younger generation that is hungry for freedom, and they're hungry for truth. And so they're, they're figuring out what they need to do 
to try to find that truth and they're finding it in the music and, and every day every day you see more and more young people becoming more awoke and more awakened to like the things that are happening around them and then that's when they go back right they go back and see things like they see James Brown and they see this music from the 70s and 60s and they're like okay wow like I didn't even know this existed because they, never, they were never taught mm -hmm. right so it's like a lot of times we kind of chastise them but it's hard to chastise them when they don't know you know, if we teach them and then they still don't do it, that's a different story. But if they haven't been taught something, then it's a little difficult. So I think the movement of the 60s and the movement that's happening today, it, it goes hand in hand. Of course, there are different uh, intricacies that are involved, but it's definitely alive and well. And, and I think some of the same demands that were, that, were, that were sought after then are being some of the same demands that are being sought after today. So. I would probably want to add to that and thinking about black music and the long tradition of the civil rights movement, yeah. not just bracketing it in a certain um, time frame, but the long tradition of the civil rights movement and how music has always played a role. And what we find also with today's youth, I would probably argue that um, black youth culture with respect to the contemporary moment um, that many were always already awakened to some of these circumstances because they were living them. And this is, of course, why we get the birth of hip-hop culture, right, and hip-hop music. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is, I think, what's, what we have to be very mindful of is how class cuts, around, cuts across um, music and class cuts across even people's experiences. And so there are, that we can't argue that there's a segment that is certainly cut off mm -hmm. from and shielded um, from some of those social realities, but out of um, the other segments, the larger segment of black and brown uh, communities, um, they were not necessarily cut off, and so that birthed what we know today as hip hop music, mm -hmm. right? And so, and much of what is hip hop music is not necessarily what you hear on the radio, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I think that's another thing where people cannot necessarily see that music as particularly revolutionary in certain ways when in fact it is, right? right? Um, and it does speak to certain conditions that people are grappling with in their own communities, not um, Yeezy and Drake in them. I'm not talking about them. <laughs> I'm talking about a whole host of other artists uh, who are speaking to those conditions and certainly going back to the 70s um, when um, it, the music first really emerged nationally and took off internationally, right? And it began to impact. That's another thing that people don't necessarily recognize is the impact of even hip hop music in other spaces outside of the United States and how it has become a force uh, in global music, a force for radical change in certain communities and, and particularly in places like um, France and Germany. And I was speaking just the other day about um, the ways in which we can argue that resistance movements don't necess shouldn't necessarily be co-opted, but in the context of the French, they have in fact co-opted. They have a minister of hip hop. Um, and so for them, uh, creating this kind of minister in hip hop is a way in which they can channel certain energies uh, and, dr and address certain um, social inequalities. But unfortunately, um, like in the United States, we still see these inequalities happening and the verdict and you know, video that you'll see a little later uh, has come down that the officers that were responsible um, in um, one of the, that were responsible for giving, I guess, the spark to the uprising in France in 2005. I don't know if you all remember, it was all over the, mm -hmm. the television and the news about the uprising in France um, and people were burning things, tearing up and everything in, re in re um, response to uh, two children being um, essentially run into an electrical um, facility and, and being electrocuted. Those, those officers were acquitted. And so, you know, so there's something to be said about what's going on today uh, across, you know, the pond as well as what's going on locally and the ways in which youth music is fueling some of those, um, or at least it's certainly giving a space for articulation of some of these crises. Mm -hmm. And I think in addition to expressing frustration, Contemporarily, music has served as a source of empowerment for young people. Um, during a time where music was produced in large studios, you had to have you know, a, a record deal and you know, all of these other kind of barriers of entry into the entertainment and cultural creation world. 
with technology, we now see that young people are able to create the sound, the songs, the lyrics that they want from their bedrooms with the iPhone mm -hmm. and, and, and get this work out into the world. That act in itself is empowering. When you can create the story of your culture, you recognize a sense of, of power and voice. And I think that carries over into the social realm. You're able to move from your iPhone, from your keyboard, and, and take that voice into kind of the real world and with your interactions with people. So when we look at the 50s and 60s, the civil rights, civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, often we have this kind of hindsight clarity where we would say that music was the soundtrack. This, this soundtrack that people used sometimes chanting when marching or as a way to kind of bolster, bolster the troops when you were possibly being spat upon or you know, right here in Nashville, we, we know the history of the lunch counters and, and so many other places where music was a part of the training to keep people in step and strong. We see that in hindsight, but I don't know that at the time, a lot of the foot soldiers would have been able to clearly articulate the role that music was playing. So similarly, right now, we, we see hip hop, we see jazz, we see a lot of underground you know, music movements that we would initially say is just entertainment. We don't, we don't see all of the connections, but I think it's difficult to see the role of any given aspect of a movement when you're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes we're looking for music to play the same role or look the same way that it did mm -hmm. in the movement of the 50s and 60s, and quite naturally it would not. It, it couldn't possibly do that. But when you are inside and active, doing work and trying to affect social change, I think you would find that quite naturally the cultural creation, the creativity, arts, music often fuel or, or spark kind of the voice of, of the unheard. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I know one thing, uh, you know, Zen mentions in the book, he mentions the, 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 the young people and how they repurpose the music of their, uh, of their spiritual communities. And even now we know that, that even those spaces that time and even now were highly segregated. So, they, so, so most of that conversation, a lot of that conversation took place in those spaces and we invited other people to be a part. Um, so I was wondering if, 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 uh, if you could share with us some of your observations where some of these and I know we you know we make we do make music on our iPads and on our laptops and stuff and I know I make a lot of music in my living room in different places and uh, we'll make some here today but I was wondering if if uh, if you could kind of uh, talk a little bit about some of the spaces that you see emerging for young people to come together and uh, and and kind of employ this creative energy. Well, I'm going to quickly call out Rashad because I, I have such a deep respect for, for the work that he's doing in schools here in Nashville, working with young people. Yeah, um, I would definitely say um, uh, the, the Nashville Public Library just um, opened up the NPL Studios, which has been um, a huge uh, part of young people being able to come in um, with a professional audio engineer, with professional equipment, and to record their music. Um, and that's been a really big thing here over the past uh, couple of months that's allowed them to be able to have this space to be able to create. Uh, Rocket Town also has been a really big part of young people being able to come in and record music and record um, the things that they're dealing with, the things that they're going through in their communities. And it's been a really good space for them to create. But I um, mean, like Eric, like you were saying, like the majority of this music that they're creating has come from their living room, has come from their mother's basement, has come from their, their cousin's house where they go and they have a two track and they have a microphone and they're recording and two hours later it's on SoundCloud. And, and, and yeah. you know, they're at this point of not really being as concerned with, you know, what we may be concerned about as far as is it, is it mixed properly? Does yeah. it sound totally great? They're not really concerned about that. Like their concern is this is what I have to say and because nobody else is listening, 
I'm going to put it out where everybody can hear it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what's happening now with the mediums. Uh, but again, like the, um, the, the, the street corners, um, you can go out on 2nd Avenue on any, on any given Saturday night and hear young people outside performing um, and rapping and having uh, live instrumentations and, and, and performing on corners. And if you listen to the content of what they're talking about, they're talking about things that are relevant to what's going on right now. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's very imperative for them to be able to get their message across any way they can like they're not really concerned about anything else other than this has to get out and I'm getting it out the best way that I know how so all those mediums have been really key especially here in Nashville with young people getting out um, their messages and their music so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say there's something about that that concerns me in terms of the quality and the aesthetic of mm -hmm. art I don't know that we would still well, actually I'll tell you <laughs> I would not be listening to Marvin Gaye if it was not quality music. I wouldn't still right now be listening to what's going on if the chord progressions and you know all of these other technical aspects mm -hmm. weren't as strong as they are. So I would wonder if if sometimes craft, if, if craft is sometimes the the element that could be sacrificed in the name of getting the message out, what happens to the sustainability of these ideas? Right. Mm -hmm. I think um, I, I, I would probably agree with you mm -hmm. because I think aesthetics are extremely important mm -hmm. when we think about the music and that's one of the aspects of even when we think about, you know, hip hop music, right? This is what, what so many re people reject because some of the lyrics, some of the stories that are being told, which are sometimes nonsensical um, in some aspects of it, actually impoverish the music, right? And yeah. they impoverish the aesthetics. And so I think aesthetics are extremely important um, to the craft, right? And to learning the craft. And so I think on the one hand, it's the urgency mm -hmm. is important. Right. Um, but equally, there has to be an understanding of the craft itself. Right, and I think that's where this new program at the public library and the things that Rocket Town is doing and the things that, that we're doing with Southern Word comes into play, right? Because we bring in these professionals who teach the students how to engineer and teach them how to uh, mix and teach them how to master their music. So I think it's very important. Um, but I was just speaking from the the standpoint of like mostly high school students who are you know are not at that point yet um, and some of them are we're going to hear from one later on today who, who who definitely is there um but you know i think like their urgency is in learning in the in the ability to just get their feet wet and in trying to figure out how this thing works so but yeah it's definitely important because you know put on the headphones you're like Ooh. yeah <laughs> you know I, I remember reading something one time by um by the uh, uh theologian and scholar James Cone and he says black music is unity music and that it places the individual in the proper context of community that the individual is not complete unless they are uh, contributing to the community and the community is contributing to them and as we talk about the roots of this modern uh, civil and human rights uh, movement um, you know, the, uh, um, you know they, there are these pockets of community and I know that if we, you know, for every Aretha Franklin that we've had or for every Marvin Gaye we've had, we've had the person that was not them, that was still in there Sunday morning singing with them, that had that opportunity. So, so you know, there was always this community that was, that was participating in that art, elevating it, refining it. Uh, you were around people that you could that you were uh, that were your mentors you know Mahalia Jackson visited her uh, Aretha Franklin's house on a regular basis because she was good friends uh, with CL Franklin and so Aretha Franklin said at people's feet she did she didn't she wasn't born singing like that she was nurtured in a community that sang like that which makes those spaces very 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 important um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit, and these things were coming up as uh, as well. But uh, but but we're gonna have an artistic presentation. Brother Rashad is gonna share a piece that some of you may have heard when it first came out, <laughs> and I'll have him set it up, and then we're gonna invite one of our one of our young brothers up to kind of to uh, to kind of illustrate the connection and the legacy of uh, of poetry and the spoken word in, in uh, African-American cultural activism. 
So I, I wanted to find a piece that I thought would, um, that would really work uh, with what we were talking about today as far as the movement and the music of the movement. And I thought there was no better piece uh, than Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Um, Gil Scott Heron is one of the main reasons why I am a poet, why I am a spoken word artist. Uh, this piece was created um, around his, um, his frustration with television, his frustration with the things you see on TV and how that they can lull you to sleep when actually there's a movement that's going on outside of that box, right? And so this piece was birthed from that, the revolution will not be televised. You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, or Spiral Agnew to eat hog malls confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the Schaefer Award Theater and will not star Natalie Woods and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nubs. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie Mae pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 832 or reports from the 29th district. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of Whitney Young being run out of Harlem on the rail with a brand new process. There will be no slow motion or still life of Roy Wilkins strolling through Watts in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he has been saving for just the proper occasion. The revolution will not be televised. Green Acres, the Beverly Hillbillies, and Hooterville Junction will no longer be so damn relevant, and women will not care if Dick finally got down with Jane on a search for tomorrow because black people will be in the streets looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news. No pictures of hairy arm women liberationists and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb, Francis Scott Key, nor sung by Glenn Campbell, Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humberdink, or The Rare Earth. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back. After a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or a white people, you will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight the germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no reruns, brothers. The revolution will be live. Well, with that said, you know it's a it's a, we, you know we have a long legacy of po of of poetry and 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 things of that nature in our in our culture. A lot of times we do look at these things as if they popped up out of nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we're gonna have uh, a, a, a another extension of that legacy. This young brother, Black Sun, has represented Nashville on the world stage at Brave New Voices. Uh, he's an award-winning poet, and uh, y'all need to give that brother a hand. I've always found my pride in fist that clinch and punch through skies. Mama, mama always said I was more Malcolm than Martin. 
more riots than peace rallies, but hey, by any means necessary, right? Right? By any means, even if living out a dream means becoming a part of a nightmare, even if seeing your people nowadays hurts your soul because they fell in love with the modern day slavery, we used to be royalty, but lost our crown somewhere in the middle passage, and now if we try to rediscover it through a hoodie, we may be murdered, don't it sound like just another black poem, just another Blame it on the system, cry for help from the victim, but I never saw a problem with dressing like midnight or looking like midnight, the thin line between the worst of your yesterdays and the best of your tomorrows, 10 points ahead of the game thanks to Bobby Seal. Thanks to Huey P, we gonna get some tactics, survive a lot of fittest, but what about those who weren't fit to survive in this madness, just scrapping up change to buy dreams? We all just rebels with our GPS set to a cause, heartbeat of a ghetto, drumming out stories of brothers who didn't grow up in my household. My mind is an alley that shelters my addiction to free speech. Don't it sound like just another black poem, black poem, black poem, we under attack poem. And I'm not just talking about my race, because truthfully enough, we're all in danger. Bred to pounce on people with weaknesses that differ from ours, we call humans aliens. Just because they speak how we don't understand whatever happened to the language of love. Hmm. LGBTQ, community of people so marginalized, I'm surprised they ain't specify whether it was college ruled. I just want to remind you that differently abled doesn't mean not able at all. And if this still sounds like just another black poem, it's probably because the world's so dark. Hmm. So let's rise. Like fist for human rights, let's rise like conversations in a room full of people willing to stretch their comfort zones. If you are human, you must rise. Uh. What's up? Thank you so much, brother. Well, we started to approach this subject and we, we've, you know, you can't really you can't really get that deep on it in an hour. But, um, but we, uh, I, I want to I kind of move to another discussion, and that discussion is, is that with all of these things happening um, in the world, uh, with all of these new, uh, or, or these, well, these new art forms emerging that have been attached to this long legacy of resistance, of praise, of protest and purpose, um, uh, I, I'd like to just kind of speak a little bit about how uh, the art that is being created and that ha has been created is uh, how it plays out on a global scale because I know that, 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 that you all have traveled extensively and I, I travel as well doing gospel music workshops and, and things of that nature in other countries. And, uh, um, and anybody that knows anything about black art is that it's just not something to look at, but it is a distillation of our social theory. You know, we put what we believe, who we are, how we feel, uh, we put it in our art, we put it in our music, we put it in our dance, and, and, and when people are in, uh, uh, are, are in it with us, they are moved by it, and it begins to change them in particular ways. And uh, I'd like to hear some of your uh, observations on how this art has influenced other cultures across the planet. Uh, I wanted to play your video as well. Uh, um, uh, could, could we run the second video? And then we'll jump into that discussion. This is the Paris the French government wants the world to see. Historic, beautiful, picture perfect. A city where French values of liberty, equality, and fraternity are meant to prevail. But there's another Paris just a few miles away. In this other France, there are no national monuments, there are no quaint sidewalk cafes, 
and no tree-lined boulevards intersecting a city of lights. Not far from the city center, the city of light grows dim. This area is called the 93, high-rise ghettos filled with poor black immigrants and ethnic French. Unemployment here runs as high as 40 percent. It's a breeding ground for resentment. They are angry that they don't feel French. They are angry at the government and at the police who they say are provoking them. He treats us like we're dirt off a car tire. I'm not a tire. Relations with the police are such that these young people expect they indeed anticipate mistreatment or violence at the hands of law enforcement. Police harassment may have sparked another French revolution. In October 2005, two teenagers of African descent were electrocuted in a power substation while dodging a police checkpoint in a suburb outside Paris. The incident set off a firestorm that lasted 21 days. These events are signposts of others yet to come. Details of the Paris uprising were brought to life by Trika Keaton, an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, who shared her research. Okay. So, um, uh, are there, uh, you know, I, I think you, something that very interesting that you brought up to me um, in, our, in one of our conversations uh, was about the Ministry of Hip Hop in France. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you speak, a, would you mind speaking a little bit about that? And well, I think just as we talked about the spaces locally uh, in Nashville in which we see um, spoken word, hip hop, uh, culture, um, dance, uh, art, all of those things uh, fall under the ministry of hip hop. And so what the French government has recognized is that for this particular generation of youth, hip hop, uh, appeals to them. It was initially inspired, of course, by American hip-hop uh, music, but the French have gone on to put their spin on things in the same way that the French made jazz French. Um, and I think that is what's particularly fascinating is the ways in which black culture, black music is transformational, transcendent, and global and considered quite cosmopolitan. Whereas we might come to certain understandings of, let's say, jazz at the time when it debuted in the United States, right, uh, out of the blues tradition, yeah. right? Uh, and, what, and gospel and what we consider beautiful now, these things were considered profane in the United States. Uh, in the same way that hip hop is considered profane in the United States. Um, but of course, when jazz made its debut, uh, along with blues and gospel, uh, in the night after the First World War, about 1919, uh, particularly in, in the European context, it was immediately embraced as this new, energizing, creative um, jazz was all gospel, all these were just new, creative, energizing.